Herkese merhabalar. Ee, öncelikle bugünkü yayınımıza geldiğiniz, izlediğiniz için, e, katıldığınız için teşekkür ediyoruz. Bugünkü yayınımız İngilizce gerçekleşecek. Ee, daha sonra bunun e, Türkçe altyazılı bir şekilde e, YouTube kanalında daha sonra ileride e, tekrarını izleyebileceksiniz. Eğer e, İngilizce e, takip edebiliyorsanız e, yaklaşık bir buçuk saatlik e, Profesör Marco Ferrari ve e, Profesör Selim Pamuk ve Profesör e, Korkut Demirel e, eşliğinde güzel bir toplantı e, sunum dinleyeceğiz. E, hepinize tekrar teşekkür ediyorum. Sunumumuzun bundan sonraki kısmına İngilizce devam edeceğiz. Onu belirtmek istiyorum. Evet, şimdi diğer katılımcılarımızın da e, görüntülerini gördüğüm zaman başlayacağım. Korkut Hocam merhabalar, hoş geldiniz. Merhaba, Merhaba Anacığım. Evet, hemen. Ee, Ferrari de bekliyorum hocam. Evet. Hello everybody. Hello, hello everyone. Ee, no. First of all, hello Professor Ferrari. Ee, first of all, thank you very much for everyone joining to our webinar. Uh, is, is the voice okay, Professor Ferrari? For me, it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. okay for me as well. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, first of all, uh, thank you very much for everyone for joining to this uh, webinar. Uh, as we have indicated in the beginning, this uh, lecture, this uh, panel will be in English, but it will be uh, then published in uh, Turkish subtitles later on uh, our YouTube channel. So our uh, users uh, can listen to that. Uh, first of all, uh, Professor Ferrar, thank you very much for uh, joining to us. Uh, actually, it's an uh, honor for me uh, to be on the same stage with my uh, mentor, with Professor Ferrari and Professor Korkut Demirel uh, to be on the same stage. Um, actually, before starting, Uh, I would like to say that um, in these uh, days we are all at home and uh, it's not it's uh, unfortunate but uh, we hope to improve ourselves with this kind of series uh, and other things and uh, with the, uh, thankfully to our uh, sponsors with uh, one of them is GC and thank uh, to them that they uh, made this available for all of us uh, and um, with this series in Turkish Aesthetic Dental Academy uh, we would like to talk about your cases but uh, before that i would like to um, i would like to say uh, some things uh, about you uh, professor marco ferrari is working in siena university and in the prostatic uh, department and uh, by the way we are in a, a master program uh, in vitim and this is a um, this is one of the big events in my uh, career uh, and we will see uh, some cases from him and we will discuss about them Uh, and uh, before starting, and I would like to say uh, uh, for Labor Day, uh, I would like to celebrate it uh, before starting. So uh, I would like to say thank you for all joining to us. Uh, and yes, uh, Mr. Marco Ferrari, we are listening to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for your kind presentation. And uh, it's a pleasure for me to join to Edad and uh, to contribute to this panel discussion is a sort of new format for a webinar. It's not really a webinar like we uh, usually uh, watch on the on computer, like um, listening to somebody making a, a full presentation. But uh, today the goal is uh, to discuss um, and to take uh, uh, some, um, some points, some uh, uh, aspect of a, a, case, mm. a case, a clinical case really Uh, done uh, in, in regular patients in order to discuss the possible uh, options we may have when we have a complex case. Uh, of course, uh, uh, I did the case, it's a patient of mine, I did personally. Uh, I, do not, I do not pretend that what I did is the best or the ideal uh, treatment, but what I like is to show what I did and step by step to discuss with uh, The, my uh, two friends and colleagues, uh, what we can uh, do, what we can offer to the patient, what option we have, and then what uh, way to solve the, the cases we can take. So uh, let me start, and don't, I don't want to lose too much time. Um, as you know, I'm, uh, as you say already, I'm from University of Siena. 
And uh, I'm very lucky person because I consider myself like that because I'm living uh, in a, a beautiful town in the heart of the country, in the heart of the Tuscany. And uh, you know that we have this beautiful uh, square, the Piazza del Campo. And uh, in Piazza del Campo, every year, twice per year, we have the Palio race, the horse race. <laughs> Unfortunately, this year we will not have uh, the Palio race because the pandemic. Uh, so you can imagine that in the inside the square there are 66,000 people. So we cannot keep the social distance uh, to prevent uh, any infection right now. So we'll postpone to next year. Anyway. Yeah. Let's see the patient. The patient is, uh, she arrived uh, to 50. She's a nice lady and uh, she's married and her chief complaint, she want to remake the smile. So uh, she has a personal, as a personality, she's energetic and positive. She's highly collaborative and motivated and uh, she has high expectation and she looks essentially for aesthetics of what function, health, but aesthetics is the main goal for her. So the medical history doesn't, um, in the medical history there is nothing uh, to note particularly <clears throat> and uh, in the dental history uh, she is in a program of recall for oral hygiene um, and she does uh, every three months. Anyway she already received endorestorative treatment and crowns and she has as an oral hygiene habit, a toothbrush twice a day and floss once per day. Let's start with the extra oral examination. Professor uh, Ferrari, uh, I think your screen is not uh, visible. Can you share your screen, please? I don't know how I can. Anyway, let me try because... Uh, uh, okay, from share content, uh, which we did before, uh, you must be able to give it in on to, uh, to, bro to broadcast. Okay, you must allow then uh, from the settings probably, it will lead you to. No, I can't. The, the, there is a green square on bottom of the screen, Marco. Maybe this. You just push this button to share your screen. Oh, Just okay. The share the screen, yes. Yeah, share screen. Yeah, exactly. But I okay. did not look in my screen. You didn't see my screen? No. No, we did not. No, okay. I'm sorry. <clears throat> I Do I have to restart again? Okay. Uh, okay. No, no, no. You, you don't have to restart. Tell me what I... Okay. From okay. the share I... contents, okay. Uh, you must... Uh, uh, hello. Okay. Yes. Yes. Now, yes, we, have... now that, we are? That... Yes, yes. Now we, we are. Okay. okay, I go straight we, we and go are... very fast to exactly. it first. Thank you, thank okay. you so much. So anyway, uh, let's go through. Uh, as I say, I'm coming from Siena. And uh, so you know uh, that I'm very lucky because I'm living in a so beautiful area in the heart of the country, in the heart of the Tuscany. And uh, hopefully everybody of you knows uh, Piazza del Campo Square, in which we have quest per year the um, Palio race, uh, usually July 2nd and August uh, 16, but this year will not have, because of pandemia, the races. Uh, and of course, I'm very lucky because uh, I can also have my uh, teaching and my clinic in uh, Siena University. So let's see now uh, about the patient. The patient is, uh, um, is uh, 50, and uh, she want to remake the smile. She want to remake the smile because, uh, and she's uh, as a personality energetic and positive, highly collaborative and motivated. And uh, she looks for aesthetics. Essentially, she has very high expectation about aesthetics. Uh, there is nothing uh, important on the medical history and in the dental history, um, she received uh, oral hygiene and the restorative treatment and crowns, as you are going to see. And then uh, she's in the program, uh, a recall program for oral hygiene every three months. And she used the tough brush to tough toothbrush twice per day and floss once per day. So about the extra oral examination, we can see that uh, she has uh, um, a sort of symmetry and uh, the 
pillar um, um, line is not perfectly in line with the horizon, and she has a, a, a fascial uh, square, and the fascial third are balanced. You can see here the different uh, shot of the face, and you can see now the smile. You can see the lip line, you can see the incisor ridge line, that is very, very important, and the buccal corridor, and how much she showed the teeth. And then you can see about the lips, the rest position, the labial seal, and the smile. You can see that she's very nice. Uh, uh, she has a very nice smile. She has a very thick uh, lip. So she's very attractive. And here you can see the smile. And look in the smile, you can understand why she wants to remake the smile. She wants to remake the smile because uh, she has um, a not so nice, I would say, uh, look, in particular in the lateral view. When we go to look the critical oral uh, diagnosis, uh, we look uh, the intraoral. We start with the intraoral examination, and uh, um, you can see already that we do not find uh, two laterals, upper laterals, and um, she missed the the two laterals, and uh, uh, also a couple of uh, uh, third molar in the lower. Then. There is uh, no abrasion, no decays. There are some fillet teeth in posterior area and uh, not vital teeth. I mean, endodontic treated tooth is uh, the canine in the left, upper left, and there is not hypersensitivity. Uh, so we have uh, a sort of diastema between uh, the lateral and the premolars in the upper, and then there is nothing, and they are malpositioned, the, the two laterals that are the canine in position of the laterals, and then there is rotation of the first two bicuspid in the upper jaw. And here you can see the class, the molar class, but you cannot see the canine class because again, the canine were moved to simulate two laterals by a previous dentist. So we also go to look um, the um, dynamic movement, Static and dynamic uh, position of the uh, of the jaws, and you can see uh, right uh, and left laterality, and you can see the protrusive movement. Then we go to look the periodontal examination, and in the periodontal examination, essentially there is nothing important to uh, to um, to note apart from the fact that we have a very deep pocket, seven millimeter pocket on the mesial area of the, lat of the canine in the upper right uh, uh, area. Uh, canine that I remember that was made as, the crown was made as a lateral. So, and here you can see exactly the seven millimeter pocket in the X-ray, there is a, a, a bone defect. And uh, uh, we have uh, uh, periodontally um, bleeding on probing on the 12, so in this area. And we have um, gingival index about 25%, and she's in the recall program. So she has a, a, approximately, I would say, a good oral hygiene. So this is the um, orthopantographic uh, uh, X ray, in which we can see the two positions of the roots of the two canines. And then we have the periapical uh, radiograph uh, status in which you can see all the teeth of these ladies. So prostodontically, now we have to solve the problem of aesthetic area anterior uh, upper teeth. So we start to be faceful, we mount the cast and articulator, and then uh, we look carefully the area in which we have in the lower some uh, uh, teeth, they are not aligned, the incisors in particular. And then you can see the rotation of the two bicuspid that uh, because the um, canine were moved uh, in the lateral position, so the canine, the bicuspid were rotated uh, in, a, in an important way. So the third thing was, okay, let's see if we can solve the, this problem by um, by orthodontic uh, um, devices. And uh, we asked to Invisalign uh, uh, to evaluate uh, 
the possibility to perform this treatment. But you can see on the right that from the first to the 25th uh, shells that can be provided by, um, by the Invisalign, we do not have the result we want. They only complete the rotation to fill the space between the lateral and the bicuspid in the upper. They don't uh, provide anything else. Uh, in the lower, in the lower, they can provide uh, uh, through the lateral, uh, uh, through the, um, the shell, they can provide uh, uh, the movement of the lower incisor and to realign the lower incisors, as you can see here. So the patient uh, then needs another extra evaluation. And in this case, we use the digital smile design. So we took some pictures and then the program, and then we simulate the movement, uh, the, the new uh, composition of the eight upper front teeth. And then we show to the patient, of course, the patient was very happy to see that uh, the smile was changing as she expected, but now we have to do that. So now we have to find a way to do what we propose to the patient, ideally. And here you can see that it's very difficult to place all the teeth in the right position, all four teeth each quadrant uh, in the uh, instead in the three they are in the position now without moving orthodontically so we went back to the our cast and our articulator and uh, our technician uh, mr bonadeo from uh, livorno made uh, the mm, a traditional wax up and you can see that into the traditional wax up we found a way again to place uh, eight teeth instead of six that that are now position in front area. So then we want to go step by step uh, to uh, evaluate the, the sextant, each tooth uh, sextant by sextant. And we follow usually the, mm, mm, this article, this uh, system that was proposed by Jack Cato many years ago. And uh, in this case, we evaluate the X-ray, the picture, and uh, we classify in favorable, questionable, unfavorable, and impossible to keep from periodontal point of view. And you can see that all the these teeth in the first sextant can be um, kept in the mouth. In the second sextant, we have the um, unfavorable situation because the seven millimeter of pocket mesially uh, in the canine in position of the lateral, but all other teeth in this mouth are uh, have a favorable uh, prognosis from periodontal point of view. And in the lower, there is no problem at all. We have a lot of bone, stability, uh, acceptable oral hygiene. She's not the um, world champion of oral hygiene on toothbrushing, but anyway, she is uh, under control, so we can keep these teeth. So now let's start our discussion on the treatment planning. So can we do some ortho? Can we do some implantology? We can think about implantology. We can think about surgery, or we can see, we can think about straight prostate. So I like to have the opinion of my colleagues. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Ferrari, for a nice uh, presentation of the case with every details uh, included. Uh, I think uh, the um, right upper uh, canine teeth uh, plays the main role uh, in planning. Uh, so deciding uh, it will be a ch challenge, uh, I think. So I would like to um, I would like to um, uh, call Mr. Pa uh, Professor Pamuk um, to uh, say uh, what does he think about the case. Uh. Thank you, Onur, for giving me the, the opportunity to speak uh, about this case. And thank you, Edat, for this opportunity. First of all, uh, when we look at the case, we see that the uh, mesialization of the canines is uh, playing a big role in, this, uh, in solving of this case. In, uh, as we know, the canines are the, uh, one of the uh, largest uh, anterior teeth. So when you mesialize this canine in place of the laterals, you will never have a good aesthetic. So what we have in this case, at the beginning of this case, they, they are as large as almost the central 
incisors. And my concern about this uh, right uh, canine in place of the lateral, which has seven millimeters of pocket, I would like to ask to Professor Demirel if it is possible, if we measurize a little bit more with orthodontic forces, can, is it possible to gain some bone in this area or will it be possible to gain a gain bone by uh, like uh, forced eruption? And if we do this, what would be the prognosis of this tooth? Because we're going to start a big restoration. So I don't want to lose one tooth just in the middle of the treatment or just a few months or few years after this uh, treatment. So will you please comment on this and then we will continue. Sure. Um, thank you so much, Selim, uh, for uh, sending me the ball. And I would like to thank the uh, EDAT, first of all, for inviting me for, uh, for this chat. And this is the first time I'm uh, discussing a case with uh, Marco. So it will be a nice experience for me. Just like you said, uh, yes, there are some periodontal options that we can keep that uh, canine in the mouth. Basically, there are three of them. The first is to mesialize that, which you have indicated that it will be a problem because of the size of the canine. If we take it next to the uh, lateral, then we will have a big lateral there, which is going to be very hard to correct. The other option is to force force drop. Yes, that's a possibility, but it uh, requires time and additional treatment. And of course, there will be some other expenses involved in that. The third treatment is basically guided tissue regeneration, which in this case, it's a simple thing to do because there is no teeth in front of it. So basically elevating a flap and putting a resorbable membrane there is not that complicated in this case. But if it had been a case with a neighboring teeth, it would have been a bit more complicated. However, the last option, which is always is the most predictable one, is take a tooth out. Because nobody would like to have a complicated problem in the middle of the treatment or in five years afterwards, after the treatment. However, this is a kind of a uh, decision that should have been made by discussing it with the patient because the patient priorities may play a role here as well. And that's what we're gonna hear from Marco, I guess, at, at this moment. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead, Marco. Okay, so uh, we, made similar evaluation that what you just listened by Kirkwood and uh, Selim. So we made uh, the treatment plan. The treatment plan is start, of course, with the periodontal therapy, initial periodontal therapy, scale and replaning. And we decide to go for extraction of the canine in the upper right, and then to place two temporary bridge from the two central incisor to the two bicuspids to make uh, uh, preservation of their socket, and then to reevaluate uh, the case. Then, in the meantime, to make uh, orthodontic treatment in the lower uh, in the lower front teeth in order to realign incisors, and then to make some uh, some restoration to replace amalgam restoration that were uh, they had some decay, and then to make the final bridges. So. This was the day in which uh, we removed the two crowns. We start to prepare the two central incisors and then uh, see, uh, we prepare also the bicuspid and then we decide to go for extraction. And you can see that we made uh, this kind of uh, uh, suture after filling the socket with something. So how we can preserve the alveolar socket? Oops, excuse me. We do nothing. We do, we use some bone substitute or what else? That is a question for Professor De Sure. Yes, okay, please, so or ahead. for somebody else. <laughs> Before we go to this stage, I just want to comment also uh, for the ortho. Yeah, sure. Yeah, in, in, instead of uh, going to a clear aligner like Invisalign, yeah. wouldn't it be possible uh, to make it 
the rotation with the regular orthodontics, I mean with the brackets and wires. And then if we can rotate both uh, premolars, bicus, first bi uh, second bicuspids, sure. or first bicuspids, then we will gain space in this area because we have a lack of space in this area to fit all these uh, teeth. Yep. So if we can gain this space, maybe after the extraction of the right uh, canine, we could uh, possibly place an implant and then restore this area with a cantilever restoration supported but uh, with one implant. Uh, I think if we would go to this way, we could, we could make, uh, we could gain some more spaces and at the end, the aesthetics, yeah. in my yeah. opinion. Yeah, you are absolutely right. Uh, that was one of the options we consider for, uh, with the patient. Uh, the patient, she's, uh, uh, she's working on uh, as, um, uh, public relations. Uh, lady, she has a company on that, and uh, what she didn't want was uh, uh, to have any brackets on the upper teeth, uh, that in upper arch. Uh, that was why we went through Invisalign evaluation. She didn't want to have the brackets, so uh, she accepted the lower because in the, and we, you'll see because in the lower with the lips, the lower lips can cover completely. But so for aesthetic reasons, she made. Some restriction to us not to go through ortho, uh, uh, traditional ortho, fixed ortho therapy. Yeah. Uh, you are absolutely right. They rotate in the two by caspid. We can gain uh, uh, a certain amount of, uh, uh, of uh, space, of room. And also, we simplify the kind of prep that we'll see in the later on. Uh, we were obliged to perform on the two by caspid. And uh, after rotating the two by caspid, uh, we may go for a traditional bridge or for implants. So we have more options, mm -hmm. that for sure. Unfortunately, she didn't want and she forced us uh, not to go for ortho in the upper arch. I see. Yeah, that's clear. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Okay. Let's get back to the options of uh, preserving the socket. Yes, I am. Is, um, I don't really know if socket preservation is a reality or a myth, but we <laughs> do it, okay? We do it because sure. that's the, what we know best uh, in our hands for the time being. Basically, in this kind of a case, if the case is like this, especially if it is canine, which is the corner teeth of the mouth, we have to do something. And as you have uh, mentioned here, there is a very thin line that we have to uh, think about. If we raise the flap and we, if we try to cover the socket with the, uh, the flap, then we have to put a membrane, then we have to reconsider the mucogingival line, which we will be deforming at this point. However, the easiest way uh, to do is just uh, take the tooth out, put some some cancellous, uh, mineralized cancellous bone there and just put an ovate pontic on it. Do nothing else. And that ovate pontic will maintain the graft in its place. And while, while maintaining the graft in its place, it will, it will make possible for the soft tissue to cover it up because the epithelium will not jump into the uh, space because the epithelium can only walk if there is a connective tissue underneath that. And that's, in my idea, is the easiest way. But there are other options. And other, one of the options is just elevate the flap, take the tooth out, and put a membrane to isolate the connective tissue to invade into the, uh, in, in the place there. That are the two options that we think. But if, in any case, if you want to elevate the flap and not use the connective tissue graft, Oh, I'm sorry, uh, not use the uh, barrier membrane there, then you cannot preserve the socket. That's the most important thing here. Either do nothing, put graft and put an ovate pontic to hold the graft there, or if you elevate the flap and if you would like to cover the site, then use a membrane. Thank you so much. That's all I can contribute here. Thank you. Thank you so much.
So anyway, now we are, um, after one week, we can see the tissue that is going to recover. And then after already one week, this, you can see that the smile of the patient changed, was improved, and the patient was starting immediately to be uh, happy and satisfied of the change that we proposed, uh, as you can see here in front, in front view. So we are just one week later, and we tested, of course, the temporaries also for uh, uh, lateral and protrusive movement. After three weeks, we remove uh, the suture. We, you can see the tissue, and you can see that we already placed the uh, bracket in the lower in the lower uh, arch. And here, step by step, you can see the tissue that after six months. Uh, was recovered completely, and you can see the smile of the patient after summer, of course. So she was very happy, and we kept a sort of test drive for six months with the temporary uh, in order that the patient was comfortable and uh, uh, digest and metabolize the new, new smile. And we were, of course, in time to make uh, any change. In the meantime, we were following the orthodontic treatment. So after six months, we are here and we have a good emergence profile. The tissue is very well uh, positioned on the temporary. And now we have to discuss a little bit how we can finalize the kind of prep, the finishing line uh, preparation for each tooth in this patient. So if we go for horizontal prep, if we go for vertical prep, or if we go for habit prep, in what teeth and, and so on. So what we prefer to do. So in this case, in this case, I personally like horizontal prep because uh, I'm a digital person. So I like to do everything digitally. I like to take digital impression and do everything on computer. So I like to have a clear uh, margin to define. If I do a vertical prep, it will be very difficult for the, uh, for the internal scanner to detect the margins. And also on the computer screen, it's going to be again difficult to mark the margin. So th therefore I always prefer doing horizontal prep. Maybe it's not, maybe in this case or in another case, uh, it's not going to be a very heavy horizontal prep. Just a margin that will be clear enough for the intro scanner and also for the software to define the margins. But in this case, but in this case, we have a rotated, rotated uh, premolars, and in some some areas, we need to make a horizontal prep. In some areas, some uh, vertical prep. Maybe in this case, in this case, instead of taking digital impression, maybe we go to a conventional and combine these two prep, combine these two preps into one tooth or uh, multiple teeth, and then continue it this way. What do you think? Uh, uh, yes, uh, Professor Denner. In my opinion, I think I don't really uh, understand why we go with the vertical prep. Because with horizontal prep, then we will have the, the margins clearly defined, which will give the dental laboratory to stop there and to make a hermetic seal between the restoration and the uh, tooth itself, because when we go with the vertical preps, we have the risk to violate the biological width there, because the, the lab cannot, cannot really define where uh, they, they're going to put the margin. So in my understanding, I understand the shortcomings of uh, horizontal prep, but in my understanding, we have to go with the, uh, the horizontal prep. Uh, I think, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Professor Demirel. Um, changing or uh, making modification in the uh, emergence profile uh, is 
much easier or maybe predictable with the vertical bread. But uh, with this case, uh, th there are also uh, some concerns, just just like uh, Professor uh, Pamuk indicated. Uh, so maybe I think uh, combining uh, both of them uh, will be wiser. But uh, the concerns that uh, Professor Demirel has indicated are also um, th things to uh, consider. So, Professor Ferrari, uh, what did you do or um, why did you do uh, which yeah. kind of preps we, we have chosen? Okay, uh, I can tell you that in our school we teach uh, both uh, kind of prep, vertical prep, horizontal prep. So, we sometimes we use a hybrid prep. Hybrid prep means for us uh, uh, to prep uh, vertically in one uh, area. <laughs> or um, one part of the margin in the same tooth in which we already prepare or we are going to prepare horizontally. So depend the situation, depend, uh, depend from different uh, clinical uh, situation, I would say. In particular, uh, on this abutment, uh, we uh, prepared uh, on front teeth in the incisors uh, with chamfer. Uh, we made chamfer because we want to have a clear uh, stop of the of the margins, and I agree with uh, uh, Selim that uh, that might be useful for uh, for the impression, might be useful for uh, for any impression, might be useful also for temporaries for relining, so we can see clearly the margin. But distally to the two bicuspids, because we have a so tight position of the two bicuspid of the root of the bicuspid. Uh, to the uh, distal tooth. So um, we went through uh, a vertical prep in order to create more room in between interproximally. And mm -hmm. then also mesially, we went through the, a prep vertically in order to achieve a little bit more room for placing the, the pontic uh, tooth. So the, the three incisors were prepared, just to summarize, uh, with uh, a, a small chamfer, um, so in horizontal prep, while, uh, whilst the two bicuspids were prepared uh, vertically, partially, and uh, partially horizontally. The two interproximal areas were prepared vertically in order to, uh, to gain more room, more space. And then at this point, uh, what kind of impression we can take? Uh, we can take, and this is a, a, a very open discussion. We can take uh, uh, analogic traditional uh, impression, or we can take a digital impression. So I like to have your opinions. Okay. Here, <clears throat> as I said before, I'm a digital person. So I would like to go to digital uh, impression if I can see very well, if I can see very well the margins, because the camera cannot see what I cannot see. I need to see everything clearly. So if I can see this, all the margins, all the area without any interruption, then I go for digital. Uh, and to go to digital, I need to have the margins at the level of uh, gingiva, or a little bit deeper, let's say not more than half a millimeter. If I go more, then I will have some problems to seeing the margins. Therefore, uh, therefore, I uh, in this case, in this case, uh, most probably I will go to analog. Uh, that means I would like I would take the impression with the silicon materials, elastomeric materials, because we have hybrid uh, because we have hybrid preps. In some areas we have verticals. In some areas we have uh, horizontal preps. So in this case, I will go to analog. But if all the teeth prep were horizontal and not deeper than half a millimeter, I will go to digital. Uh, Professor Pamuk, uh, would you think or would you consider to take digital impression again um, at the end of the waiting pro process because the patient waited for nearly six months. So in this time, uh, she had a, uh, to, to enough time to wait with the temporaries, which also would shape the uh, emergence profile and the gum. Uh, so uh, if it is not too deep, even with that, if you see clearly the margin without any inflammation, would you still uh, 
consider to take analog or would you uh, choose digital in this I, I would go for digital in that case because the, the, the uh, temporary restoration will shape the soft tissue, will enlarge. And uh, when I take them out, I will see everything very clearly if the tissue is not inflamed. Thank you. Y yes, uh, Professor Demir. I have a question here to Selim, actually to Marco as well. Does the temporary uh, restoration shape the tissue or just we simply wait enough long enough for the tissue to mature. Well, it's good both. point, good point, good point. Yeah. <laughs> Combine, yeah. It's, uh, it's, in my understanding, it's more the soft tissues got matured, basically taking the message out from here. Don't take the impression right away you prepare the tooth. Exactly. You have to wait exactly. at least three That's for weeks sure. uh, in order for the soft tissues to adapt the new situation. But having said that, I'm talking about the horizontal preps because at this point, I still have a question to Marco. And uh, the question to Marco is, you mentioned that you, went, uh, you made vertical preps in between two bicuspids there. Yes. And making that uh, vertical prep, does it involve the subgingival root spaces as well? No, really. So it's a kind of a super gingival. Uh, no, I would say not super gingival, to be honest, but uh, I would say there is a yuxta gingival prep. Okay. In any way, Selim, it needs uh, the tissue, it needs time for the tissue to heal up. And uh, uh, I don't really want to give the, the wrong message here, yeah, which sure. uh, as being a, a periodontist, you, you cannot shape the soft tissue with the temporary. Yeah, the, the, the tissue matures and... Yeah, yeah, we can say this. That, yeah. That's the point I would like to underline. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. sorry about that. That, that, yeah. that. That's why that's why we wait at least three weeks, four weeks before taking the impression in these cases. Maybe that's the most important uh, point that we could make it here. Wait yeah. long enough for the tissues to mature before making the impression. Yeah. It's just the same in implant dentistry as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Some people, some people take the uh, the cover screw out and just make the impression at that time. Yeah, it I may totally be acceptable agree. in the posteriors, but in the anteriors where Marco is working now, it's just uh, a big could be a very big mistake. Sorry about that, uh, Demiral. I agree with you. I uh, I would like to point out that in this particular case, in which we have also an extraction of the canine with uh, a deep. Uh, socket, so we wait more than six months before taking impression. Mm -hmm. uh, so as I show you, uh, I completely agree when there is uh, some bone that is touched uh, for any reason, extraction, or for a perio uh, uh, flap in which we, uh, we do, uh, I don't do personally, but uh, in which is done uh, some uh, resection of the bone, we wait at least six months in front area, at least. And uh, we know that the complete maturation of the uh, gingival tissue is around one year. Of course, we cannot wait one year because as a prostodontist, I'm, I became crazy to leave uh, temporaries in the, in the mouth so long. <laughs> uh, but uh, at least six months uh, in order to have a stable uh, tissue before taking impression is the, the, right, uh, the right time. At least in, in our department, we do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. They, so, they also patients. Professor Ferrari, can we say that? Sure, please. Uh, uh, can we say that same day dentistry is not um, uh, is not available for all of the cases as it is marketed? No, that for sure. Uh, but depend uh, again. Uh, uh, I agree with my, with all of you. I um, I think that is. Uh, uh, depending on uh, where we place the margin. If we, do, we place the margin yuxtagengibly or supragengibly, we can take impression anytime. But when we go yeah. around the tissue where we want to mask uh, 0.5 or 1 millimeter into the sulcus, we have to wait that the sulcus is completely healthy. So that for sure. Uh, the real secret of uh, so-called uh, bioemulation, biocompatibility or what else is don't touch the tissue. Stay far from the tissue. It's so easy. Uh, very simple. 
unfortunately, people, they think that to place inside into the soul coast deeply uh, and they want to show that everything is compatible. Might be compatible if the patient is a, a, a strong brusher, a brushing a teeth at least three times per day and uh, using the floss and avoiding plaque accumulation. So probably also a margin place into the sulcus can be kept for a long time. But how many patients they do that? So that is the point. How many patients they brush pr uh, uh, regularly three times per day and, uh, and then they use the floss and, uh, and inter interproximal brushes how many? Not so many, at least in my area. So I try to stay getting older. I try to stay farther from the tissue. So one day dentistry, one visit dentist is just for people who can do this kind of treatment. I mean, at the level of gingiva or above, if you go, like uh, Marco said, uh, down to the gingiva, below gingiva, you should wait. You should wait. At least you should wait because the, uh, there will be bleeding. And when there is a bleeding, it will be very difficult to take a proper impression, either uh, digitally or analog. Absolutely. If there is bleeding, don't take impression. No. Re Relute the temporary and leave the patient. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Send so, the patient home. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> and so another uh, question, a uh, very nice, interesting question, how we treat the tissue. Because we are talking about the tissue, what is the management of the tissue we want to perform? Uh, so this is another uh, issue that I would like to discuss with you because we may have a, a no cord or single cord, double cord, or uh, to use a Teflon. And then also, if we go to use any, um, um, any solution in order to condition the tissue and to uh, control possible bleeding. So that is another interesting question for clinicians. Well, uh, I personally, I personally do not like to place court and I try to place my margins at, uh, at level of gingiva and try to wait long time, long time uh, for the maturation of the soft tissue. But if I need to place a cord, then I go for single cord, just to make just to make a uh, horizontal enlargement, not vertical horizontal enlargement. Because, as I said, I do digital impression, and if I if I go vertically, the the camera will not see it because I won't see. So I I would prefer either no cord or single cord. Double cord for me it's too much invasive uh, for the soft tissue. And at the end, in my hands, I have some problem with this uh, double cord uh, displacement. Uh, I would like to have uh, the opinion of uh, Korkut on this matter, uh, because it's really important for the end result. Yes, I mean, I can provide the perio perspective about it, because yeah. I have no idea about the prospect here. But the thing is that, I understand you guys that you, uh, you are trying to make a good impression, which the impression can get in and uh, make the cast of the place. However, uh, I personally think that the visuality is not the problem there. It's the gingival crevicular fluid is the problem there. Because that gingival crevicular fluid, you have to stop that in order to make a uh, impression. And in my understanding, when you place the first cord, which is the thin cord, next to the epithelial attachment to the root surface, but the important thing is that don't touch the epithelial attachment. Don't is it tell possible? It. It's very delicate. It's delicate. It's delicate, but we are trying to mimic the nature. Mimicking the nature is something delicate. Yeah. So first place the, the, uh, the thin cord at the level of epithelial attachment without tearing it, without uh, any kind of damaging it. And over that, a second cord, which is a bit thicker, should be placed over the first one, which will additionally contract the gingival tissues there, 
But the aim is not contracting the gingival tissue. The aim is to stop the fluid flow from the connective tissue through the epithelium into the sulcus. And uh, what I have learned a long time ago in, uh, in one of the uh, prostate departments, they remove the second cord first. Yeah. And they remove the first cord, cord last, after the impression is made. But the idea is that we are not trying to only contract the tissue, we are trying to stop the gingival crackler fluid there. So that's my point of view. And no cord is acceptable as well if the preparation margin is supragingival, of course. Yeah. Because supragingival, you don't need anything. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the there is a new uh, study uh, on the prostatic department of New York University, a periodontal consideration of uh, for adhesive ceramic dental restorations, key points to avoid gingival problems. They have published many cases uh, which are taken with um, double core technique and without taking a good care, they have got uh, big recession problems in future. So uh, they are telling that it's a, a key point to uh, take impression uh, without course, if possible, if it is supragingival, or um, if we need to uh, take the impression, they say, be gentle as you can. So in the uh, summary of the uh, study says it, and it's a very nice study to summarize it. Y yes, uh, Professor Demira. I do understand you, but carelessness is not acceptable. That we cannot just uh, cover a mistake with another mistake. So that, that's, that was my point. Of course, there are cases that a cord is not necessary, which as you and Selim has uh, said, like the supragingival prep. However, if you're getting intrasulcular, you have to deal with the uh, gingival curricular fluid. Thank you. What, what, what about the materials for uh, gingival point of view? Is there any differences between these materials like adrenaline, ferric sulfate, ferric chloride, aluminum sulfate, sulfate, uh, aluminum chloride? Is there any difference uh, for the gingival tissue? Does, does the question come to me? Yes, yes. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, because we're talking we're about... Making pressure in periodontist. Yeah. I don't know. I have no idea. Okay. I have I have read no paper about the influence of the certain chemicals in this uh, thing. I'm sorry okay. about that. Yeah. Okay. So if I can tell you what is my preference, usually I'm going to for no cord or for single cord. Yeah. And when I go for no cord, I try to have a pressure through. Uh, filling the temporary with uh, some light material and leaving the light material to, to set and then we make pressure through the light uh, on the tissue uh, through a cotton roll that the patient can keep for 10 minutes strongly and uh, so we have a, a, an opening uh, a gently opening of the circus uh, because of a physical pressure nothing else so we don't uh, pack any cord or the other solution is to use as I'm going to show you in this case uh, a single cord and we use as a single cord uh, a uh, um, three zero suture silk as a retraction cord and the suture silk is much more compatible I would say than uh, a traditional uh, cord material for uh, uh, for the sulcus mm -hmm. so here you can see the patient after uh, immediately after the final impression so uh, this is uh, how we can see uh, the, the retraction cord, the, the suture seek as a retraction cord placed into the sulcus. These are the, the, the, the final impression we took in polyvinyl xiloxan. This is uh, excellence by GC. And then we also go to uh, make registration in centric occlusion in this case. We don't look for a centric relation, we go for um, the centric occlusion, the maximal intercuspidation of the patient, because we don't want to change the vertical dimension of the patient. So now, what kind of material we are going to select for this case? And I like to open again, possible discussion on that, because we have many options in prostate, and we have a felspatic ceramic, we may have 
uh, lithium desilicates and then polymer and then zirconia, uh, reinforcing lithium silicate or zirconia. So a different kind of zirconia. So I like to discuss also the choice we did and what kind of option we may have. Okay, so we're dealing with an anterior restoration. So the, the aesthetic is important, but the strength is not as much important as uh, aesthetic because we're not going to bite, uh, we're not going to chew with this, with this teeth. Maybe only we're going to bite something. So uh, first we need to uh, consider aesthetics and then the strength. Feldspatic ceramics, it's going to be too weak for a bridge restoration because we're going to make a four unit bridges on both sides. And feldspatic ones are so, there will be aesthetics, but the strength will not be uh, enough, enough. enough for this kind of uh, restoration. Uh, lithium desilicate, we may use because it's in the anterior region, it's in the anterior region, it's going to be very aesthetic. And I believe it will be, it will have enough strength for the anterior uh, four unit bridges. When we go to zirconia, either monolithic zirconia or zirconia with, uh, that we layer with uh, ceramic. Uh, I have some, you know, I was the first in my country uh, using zirconia and I placed a lot of zirconia together with honor. honor uh, we made a lot of, a series of zirconia. 2002, we 2002, started. Yeah, with Sercon, when Sercon just came to Turkey. At the beginning, it was so nice, but in time we had some uh, fractures, we, have, we had some chippings, uh because of the nature of the zirconia which is uh, which is not conduct very well heat uh, it's heat warms up later and uh, cool cool down again later when you cover it with this ceramic the, uh, the layered ceramic is warming up earlier and cooling down uh, again earlier that that uh, causes some kind of stresses in the interface. Uh, up to now, I didn't see any monolithic, even uh, multi-layer uh, zirconia, uh, whatever it is, which gives me enough aesthetic. So in this case, in this case, I will take some risk and I would go to lithium desilicate, not to zirconia. Uh, how about the margins, Professor uh, Pamuk, if uh, they need to be thin and if this is a bridge and would you uh, still prefer uh, lithium desilicate? Yeah, the, the, the, new the new materials are strong enough because in the, in the anterior area, how much, going, how much uh, strength you need? You're, you're going to just bite, that's all. Bite something, man, you're not going to chew. For the posterior, okay, it's, you, you have much more risk. But in the anterior, I, I will okay, take this risk. I will take this risk. Uh, yes, uh, Professor Demirel. As a periodontist, yeah. I have no idea the, between the difference of any of them. But I would go for particle filled pressable glass ceramics. Because the bullet looks very nice. The color of the bullet is very nice. Uh, but uh, this particle fit pressable glass I mean, will not won't have enough strength. No, I'm just I'm I'm, I'm just joking because yeah, yeah. the bullet is pink yeah. here. If I it like is pink single color, restoration, that's, that's okay. Good. If it is single restoration, it's okay. If, if it is I single, have no idea. That spatic is also okay. <laughs> the horizontal prep. I have no idea. I have been serious for one hour, so I, that's that's my. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Okay. Okay. Let's go on. So we decide to go for zirconia uh, frame because uh, uh, we want to have a strong connection between uh, pontic and uh, abutment, and uh, in this case, you can see that the zirconia was cut buckly. Uh, the frame, I mean, 
uh, in order to, uh, to have the possibility to layer with porcelain the, the two frames. And uh, then we go in the mouth and we check uh, uh, the margins. We check also the shade, uh, the shape of the, of the teeth, uh, the incisal edge. And we can see that the incisal edge was, was probably a little bit longer. So we are going to cut a little bit so we can make some sign some uh, with uh, a pencil uh, on, the, on the, the frame. And these are the, final two, the two final bridges after being layered with porcelain by our technician. So you can see the two bridges again. And this is the day in which uh, we are going to remove the temporary and then we are going to place uh, uh, the uh, final bridge. And you can see the tissue, the tissue seems to be almost, almost, not completely, but almost in a good health, it's still maturing a little bit in some area in which you can see in the mesial area of the uh, right central incisor, there are some uh, uh, capillar vessel that can be seen. Probably the tissue is still recovering a little bit in, the, in that area. So this is the view occlusally. And then uh, these are the final uh, uh, cast that I already described you. And this is the try-in of the bridge. Why we talk about the try-in of the bridge in the patient that uh, she's waiting for the final treatment. Now I show you. So because we want to try the statics, we want to be sure that the patient is happy. And then we want to be sure that the period tissue is happy. That is very important. Uh, we use it, uh, uh, zirconia and uh, uh, porcelain by GC, uh, initial, uh, the porcelain. And, uh, and so, but you can see that uh, if you look at the, in the lower area, you can see that probably you can note that the incisor movement of the incisor is not completely yet. So we decide to check carefully and then to leave the patient with the upper uh, bridge, but as uh, uh, the, the, the temporary bridge, not the final bridge. And then we have now reached the, the end of the endodontic, orthodontic treatment, the lower, and we have to, in this kind of patient, we use to splint the incisors after being uh, moved. And uh, uh, we decide to go for uh, um, a 3D printer resin splint. This is an experimental, still experimental uh, procedure. It's not, uh, uh, well, we publish something on that. Uh, as you can see in the, in the lower uh, line, um, but there are not so much documentation. So uh, we took uh, intraoral scanning impression, and then we design uh, on the software of the 3D printer, uh, we design uh, the splint. We have to provide a thickness of the splint enough to, be, uh, to have the um, strength uh, of the teeth and the occlusion. Uh, of course, uh, uh, this material is resin, so it's an experimental resin that we are testing. And uh, when you print the splint, you can print more than one. <laughs> you may print simultaneously two, three, or four for the same patient. You can keep in the small boxes just in case you'll have the bonding or fracture. So uh, the printing procedure is very cheap, it's very easy. Uh, after doing the job once, you can repeat that, and that is fascinating. Um, uh, and uh, it's very attractive uh, to use uh, the digital procedure. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is the day in which we deliver the final bridge and the splint. We have everything ready. So what kind of cementation we go to make? We go for conventional adhesive, uh, conven excuse me, uh, conventional for adhesive or for um, a simplified adhesive like self-adhesive resin cement. And in what area, in the upper and in the lower, what we can do? Well, for Professor Ferrari, ah, yeah. I'm sorry, well, Pamuk. I would just add one note. The, the idea of the sprint is very clever. Uh, I must say that because uh, taking impression in orthodontic patients or uh, when the teeth are mobile, it's it's a very very very big issue. Every clinician knows it. Yeah. So, uh, but using the digital it, it, impression, it's a, it's a big pain. Yeah. Is fantastic, fantastic. Yeah. Did you have it's any complications easy. in the during this time? Is easy. And did you have any complications after the patient? No, I show you. No, nothing. No, absolutely. At, at the moment, not. Or, 
but we have uh, on, we have only 20 uh, splints uh, that we looted more than uh, well two years a couple of years at least and uh, and so we are waiting for before being sure that uh, I would love to have a, a stronger raising probably uh, mm -hmm. but uh, till now it seems that this kind of raising that is an experimental raising made by GC for uh, 3D printer. So it mm -hmm. seems that is good enough to have the occlusal forces and the possible movement, removement um, yeah. of, the, of the lower incisors. Yes, Salim, Thank please. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yes. I, I, I just want to make a comment on this. I saw some uh, orthodontists in my country uh, doing uh, this splint in titanium milled titanium. Sure. They take imp uh, digital impression and send it to somewhere and they received uh, titanium, uh, just a very thin, uh, like a wire, wire like titanium milled uh, retainers so, and they will cement this. Did you have any experience with this kind of uh, retainer? No, I don't have it. Uh, I don't have it because uh, how that you cement titanium to enamel, yep. so yep. that is very difficult. difficult. Uh, I'm in, I believe that uh, orth um, orthodontists they made a, a very nice uh, uh, procedure for splinting for many many years, just making a, a two spot of resin composite yep. on the two canine lingually, and then to have a, a wire, a thick wire. So if we want to uh, to change this procedure, we need something easy, uh, something that can bond on the enamel. Yeah. And titanium, honestly, I do not believe that can bond. Yeah. Uh, maybe yeah. there are some, uh, maybe, I don't know, uh, some magic solution like sealant that they can bond. But honestly, uh, I don't see why I have to complicate so much with titanium that is much more costly to make a splint like this or zirconia when I can do with a 3D printer. So 3D printer is something that is perfect for this job. It's perfect for making mm -hmm. temporaries. Uh, for um, everything can be used as resin, probably, at the moment, uh, because it's cheaper and we can use in the in the office. We can use in the lab. So it's very very easy. A dentist having time and having some uh, attitude to digital can make the, with a the 3D printer the splints by himself. So I try to keep easy everything when I can. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Professor Ferrari. Last question about this topic. Uh, do you sandblast the plastic material uh, which is printed uh, before cementing? You mean uh, the, the resin in this case? Uh, yes, yes, the resin. Okay, do you the, the, the, the, the resin splint. No, I don't sandblast so much. I don't use sandblasting in this case because they are, um, GC has a, a cement, uh, uh, box, uh, a box for cementing in which there is um, a universal primer that is uh, also very, uh, is a sort of sealant that is um, uh, chemically bonded very well also resin and not only for, uh, desilicate or, or, or zirconia. So I try to go for that. Okay, thank you very much. And for cementation part, uh, before continuing, uh, Mr. Uh, Professor Pamuk, uh, which cementation type would you prefer in this uh, conventional bridge? Yeah, for, for or what, what would be your choice? Yeah, for the lower for the lower one, we got for sure for adhesive. But for the upper one, uh, you can you can we cannot etch uh, zirconia. So adhesive or simplified adhesive for me it's out of question. So let's discuss. Uh, conventional with, uh, you know, uh, polycarboxylate or this kind of things or GI cement. Personally talking, it's not based on a uh, research or evidence, etc. Just my personal belief, GI in my hands doesn't work well. I don't like. I, I really don't know. Since the introduction of GI cements many, many years ago, I could not adapt myself to use GI cement. So in this case, 
I'm, as we are using, as we are cementing, as we are cementing a zirconia based restoration. So I go for a conventional one. I would use polycarboxylate or this kind of uh, cement. Because when you use GI, whenever you need to remove this bridge for some reason, for some reason, it's, it's going to be very difficult. It's going to be very difficult. But with the conventional one, it is just small uh, tap, you can take it out. And if there is a problem underneath, you can restore it, you can uh, treat it, and then you can re-cement it. This is my opinion. This is my opinion, yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, Professor Demiral, uh, can we take your concerns about the cementation uh, progress uh, pr process uh, without regardless of the uh, cement type? Uh, can we take your um, concerns about uh, th this topic uh, as a periodontologue? Yeah, sure. I mean, the, the discussion of the material is beyond my knowledge, so I cannot uh, make any comment here. But uh, what I would uh, say here is that the excess cement should be uh, cleaned uh, properly. So the choice of cement from a pure periodontal perspective is whatever you can uh, clean easily and efficiently use that cement. But that doesn't mean that it's a good cement to uh, dilute two things together. Hmm. But in this area, that uh, a dentist should be aware that the excess cement in the, in the sulcus would work as an initiation for the parental disease. So for that reason, for the sake of longevity of the restoration, we have to clean it up. And sometimes, some people, I know that they, if they're looting a bridge there, they put a, a gingival of, um, string, it's a, a dental floss, I'm sorry, a dental floss under the bridge before they cement it so they could be uh, possible to clean the surfaces. But there, now there are other devices to do that. As a, for example, we know that there is a cord which is a hardened end so we can, I don't want to use the name, so that's the reason how I uh, translate. So we can use uh, those uh, gingival floss, dental flosses under the bridges. So that's my perspective. Thank you very much. So you, you, you need to stay clear of soft tissue in order not to have remnants of cement in the sulcus. So basically, the sensitive cleansability is an issue there. Yeah. If you go deeper, you cannot clean, you cannot clean enough the sulcus area you, mm -hmm. if the margin is so deep. Yeah. yeah. It's also a big issue for also implant supported restorations. Uh, cement, cement is also a big issue. Uh, for yeah. the type of restorations because we go uh, under the gum line in many cases. Yeah. Um, and Professor Ferrari, can we take uh, your yeah. opinion about the conventional materials uh, as just yeah, uh, uh, Professor Pamuk said about his concerns about glycinomers cements? Yeah, okay. Let's go through the cementation with it. This is the looting procedure in the lower. Uh, we use micro brush in order to remove easily a raising excess during the uh, the splint uh, procedure uh, during the looting uh, procedure of the splint uh, and uh, of course we use rubber dam uh, you can see that the bracket are still in place but uh, we uh, remove the, the wire and then after that we remove also the bracket as well um, in the upper in the upper the situation is uh, uh, I go for traditional on the zirconia that is uh, a metal oxide of zirconio. Uh, so I go usually for a traditional uh, looting uh, procedure. So we go to loot with uh, uh, zinc phosphate or in this case, I much prefer the glaciolomer, uh, gla reinforced glaciolomer cement like uh, uh, Fujicham 2 or something like that. Um, I believe that uh, when we prefer full crown and when we prefer uh, with some uh, retentive shape of the teeth. 
So we do not need uh, to have a, a raising cement, stronger cement. We need uh, to have, uh, because the retention is already done macromechanically by uh, friction of the walls between the, the abutment and the, and the internal surface of the crown. So um, in this case, I much prefer to use uh, um, traditional impression, uh, traditional uh, cement. Also for another reason, because uh, it's impossible to uh, age zirconia. Zirconia is a very, very strong metal oxide. We cannot age. The only option is to use a self adhesive But my question is why I have to, to use self adhesive that uh, also accordingly with what uh, Kurt could say uh, just say is more difficult to remove excess interproximally from the sulcus. So I try to stay with something that is uh, uh, safer, at least in my hands. I don't have nothing against uh, self adhesive cement I use uh, in my practice, in my school, but in this particular case, when I have a zirconia, I try to avoid to use them. So this is the case after one year. So you can see laterally, you can see the cruiser surface, you can see the protective movement, and then you can see the better picture. You can see on X-ray. On the X-ray, you can see uh, the tissue, you can see before and after, and then you can see the period charting that we do not have any uh, pocket around this abutment. So this is the status at the end, uh, at the recall. And then we have also in the lower, now we have all the teeth that are, uh, the incisor are aligned. And then the patient is able to keep a good oral, hy oral hygiene and not to have uh, uh, any uh, probing depth or more than two or three millimeters. This is the before and after the periodontal charting. And, and this is the smile of the patient at the end that she looks uh, satisfied and in my view, she looks uh, very, very nicely. And these are the lips. You can see the incisal edge and you can see the smile. So, and the emergence profile. So that is what we did. Again, uh, as I told you at the beginning, I do not pretend that that it was uh, the ideal treatment. Uh, other options were uh, uh, for sure uh, available, uh, other uh, option as a, as um, treatment, uh, treatment plan for this patient. But anyway, this in our view was the right compromise for this patient. Yeah. You, you are lucky because the lip line is not very high. Yeah, but of course. The, <laughs> no, <laughs> but on the, other, on the other hand, she has a very big smile, large smile. Yeah, sure. So when you go, if we need to talk about the buccal corridor, yes, there are some black area in this buccal corridor. Maybe I would include uh, on both sides one laminate veneer on the second premolars. Yeah, that might be an option. option. Sure, that might be an option for sure. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we focus our attention on the eight uh, front teeth, and mm -hmm. the patient agree on that. Uh, but anyway, your, the solution you propose is absolutely correct. Yeah. This way it's going, it will be much more harmonious. Smile. Yeah, yeah, it can be a nice detail, I would say. <laughs> nice <laughs> to take it. But can be, can be can be absolutely right. If you have any other comments, otherwise I complete my presentation. I want to thank all of you for your kindness to participate to discussion. And then uh, of course, I want to thank uh, uh, Edad and uh, Onur that is representing the society for organizing this uh, very challenging <laughs> uh, format that is very nice in my view. So I'm hoping for uh, we, we thank or discussion you. As, as you want. Yeah. Uh, we, we thank you very much, uh, Professor Ferrari, first of all. Um, we have some questions also from um, from the audience. I would like to direct it to you and uh, to uh, uh, other uh, panelists also. Uh, before going to uh, uh, passing to them, um, only for uh, making a contribution to a uh, smile design part, uh, the new softwares make uh, much, much better simulations for the patients. 
the, uh, the for the planning part uh, it was uh, perfect but for the simulation uh, the old versions or with the photoshop they are uh, they seem uh, dull on the face and they seem fake but the new software is really nice and very actively uh, this is only for of course for uh, contacting with the patient i only want to uh, add this to a uh, smile design part sure, uh, sure. okay and um, before um, Going to questions, I would like to apologize uh, from everyone. I, I uh, forgot to introduce uh, Professor Korkut Demirel and Professor Selim Pamuk in the beginning. I'm sorry for that. Professor Selim Pamuk is a prosthodontist and is a is former um, president of uh, EDAT. And Professor Korkut Demirel is uh, is the former uh, president of Europerio and he, he's a periodontalist, uh, periodontalist, by the way. So uh, after giving this information, uh, and we can continue to our questions. Um, so uh, I think one of the questions was asked uh, before Mr. Pamuk has directed it to you. Uh, and one question is, why didn't you prefer a high trans transcend monolithic zirconia? Uh, Professor Ferrari. Uh, well, because uh, that is, uh... Uh, is a long uh, discussion maybe because uh, uh, the high translucent zirconia um, is uh, a material that is much more, uh, I, I would say, with a different model of elasticity and much and much lower uh, flexural strength than uh, poor zirconia, I would say. Uh, so uh, we use uh, this traditional zirconia with high flexural strength around 1000. <clears throat> in order to, and then we, in order to have a, a strength, and then uh, uh, we, as I show, um, I showed, I, uh, our technician infiltrated uh, before sintering the zirconia with some special color, uh, the zirconia as well, in order to, itself, in order to uh, simulate the denting, and then to have the, the effect of denting uh, from inside. <clears throat> if you use uh, the new um, more translucent uh, <clears throat> zirconia, you have a, a lower flexural strength and the flexural strength is much closer uh, to uh, lithium desilicate. And uh, also, uh, but that is a, um, our, uh, our uh, information uh, that we are going to publish pretty soon because we already submit the paper. Uh, this new um, high translucent zirconia has uh, uh, some defect inside. So it seems mm -hmm. that there is some fracture inside that we did not, we discovered that occasionally uh, making uh, other study and cutting the samples. Um, now we are trying to understand why we have this kind of uh, defect inside. And when we have a defect inside, if the defect is placed uh, on the margin, we may have a break of the margin. So that is something that uh, we do not like so much, honestly. Yeah. Uh, also, I want to be very honest, I do not have so much experience on uh, um, high translucent zirconia. So for that, I believe that, uh, uh, well, somebody else for sure is much better than me to answer the question about uh, the this kind of uh, high translucency zirconia. But when you increase the translucency, you lose mechanical properties. When you increase the mechanical right. property, you lose translucency. So we have to adapt and a little bit to find the, the right uh, compromise between these two. Yeah. I think the balance is very important. Mm -hmm. Do you have any comments about the material choice uh, of uh, monolithic zirconia, uh, Professor Pamuk? Well, the monolithic zirconia, Okay, the, the, the, uh, this came to the market because of the chipping of the uh, zirconia together with the ceramic. But up to now, up to now, aesthetically, I didn't see any restoration which pleased me aesthetically. And secondly, let's say these high translucent uh, zirconia, I didn't see two cases which matches the same color 
always the, the, the, the, the never never and never i didn't see uh, this color match on these uh, high translucent zirconia that's why i am avoiding to use this uh, material there is always a color problem uh, there are uh, the new ones with the... it comes, comes very pearly most of the time very pearly there are new materials which have got some degradation, uh, Professor Pamuk, the, the new ones with the three colors, with five colors inside. So uh, did you have any experience also with them uh, regarding of the color? Yeah, I, I did uh, three or four cases with them. And let's say, let's take the color A1 or A2. Uh, four of them were different. Hmm. They are okay. not the same colors. That A A two. It's a, it's a very common color. Okay, I think the standards must be set in time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, we have some questions for uh, Professor Demirel. I would like to ask them uh, in a combined way. Um, the first one is some patients' gingival fluids are extreme. Even uh, the uh, participant says. Uh, he places the cord, uh, they still see it's on the cavity of the margin. Um, and uh, for uh, regarding to this kind of issues, uh, do you recommend uh, or do you uh, suggest to use, um, instead of these ones, uh, the chemical products like uh, 3M astringent or uh, the other products that can be um, put onto the uh, gingival sulcus uh, before taking the impression? Do you recommend this kind of uh, chemical products? Um, thank you. Uh, but uh, I've already mentioned that I have no idea about these chemical products. However, the ba basic basics of cord placing, as far as I know, I'm not a professor, so as, as I said before, is that you have to dip it into some kind of a solution that will uh, stop the flow of the uh, gingival curricular fluid. Because the stopping or slowing down the gingival curricular fluid does not based on uh, the pressure that's been applied by the core. Basically, it's the chemical solution. But I have, as I said before, I have no idea which solution is more biocompatible than the other one. In this case, what I remember from the slides that uh, Mark had shown, adrenaline is a good solution because that's uh, what we have in our body as well. However, we have to be very cautious about the, what happens with the uh, pe people who may have been influenced by adrenaline, like the hypertension. But I don't have, I don't know any uh, studies that are about uh, that are testing this question. So I'm sorry, I cannot answer, uh, answer the chemical. But yes, a chemical needs to be used. I think the time is needed to answer this kind of new, new materials uh, response in time. And one more question with the uh, periodontal part, uh, Professor Korkut Demirel, uh, which is the best retainer considering the periodontal health in, uh, in the long term? Um, I cannot comment on material, but I can comment that uh, the cleansable one is the best retainer, whatever okay. that is, I don't know. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And uh, Professor Ferrari, uh, yes. The, yes, they would like to learn that uh, if you could separate the bridge from the midline, uh, cause midline diastema, uh, why did you go with mono block bridge instead of two segmented bridges? I don't understand the question. Uh, I think the, uh, they, they'd like to learn uh, why did you choose a, a mono bridge instead of a, two different bridges, two segmented bridges? And not just one? Sorry? You mean uh, why I did two bridges, small bridges, then one? Uh, no, no, they, they, they asked that. Uh, why did you choose a one bridge instead of two bridges? Uh, it is no, two. I did two. Two? It is two. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's two. Okay. There were okay. two, okay. not just one. Okay, yes. Okay. Yeah. Two. Yes. Two bridges. Because it's asked twice, so uh, I conflicted that the bridges are two. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Maybe they wanted to ask the 
okay, another uh, from another aspect. The, there is another question dealing with this one. Why he did not choose to make one piece bridge? In, uh, there is also this question. You can see that too. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> Maybe the opposite. They want to know why I made two and not one. I don't know. I guess right. maybe, maybe, maybe. Yeah. Well, first of all, I try to to work with small bridges when I can, and possibly with single crown. In this <laughs> case, I cannot make a single crown, so I can make because they were pontics. So I made uh, two small bridges. So it seems to me more reasonable, easier, and uh, more control. And then uh, also because uh, in case I may have in the future one of the natural uh, vital abutment going to be endodonty treated. So I can work in just in one small, smaller bridge than in a full uh, sextant, I would say, bridge, much easier. Yes. Uh, and one more question. Uh, what will be the treatment procedure if uh, the tooth number um, 13, uh, the right upper canine has no periodontal problem and loss on the mesial. Uh, how we uh, how we can uh, fit our eight unit uh, tooth pre treatment plan here? Uh, here probably without ortho treatment. That is my my personal uh, opinion. Then uh, Salim and Korkud may may say something. Uh, in my opinion, if we do not go for ortho we cannot keep the canine in place. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because the canine is just in the yeah. middle of the yeah. lateral and yeah. the canine yeah. pole, just, yeah. just in the middle. So yeah. it's a big issue, yeah. I think. Yeah. Independently from the period situation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You have no yeah. choice. You have no choice. Yeah. I think we even have to move it yeah, or yes. take it out. There, there was no yeah. other option to restore it directly, I think. And also, I think it, it will be a big uh, issue in the future, uh, Professor Demirel, using uh, the canine without any periodontal problem, uh, making it just in the middle of the uh, two teeth, like lateral and canine, and cleaning it will be a big issue for the patient if uh, it was treated directly with a periodontic approach. I mean, it's almost impossible to uh, treat that canine if the canine is in the middle of two teeth. So basically, the, uh, the sacrifice there is for aesthetic reasons in this case. But if it would have been possible to move it or uh, upright it to the distally with the space that has been built up by the twisting of the uh, bicuspids, then a cantilever to a lateral would be the choice of treatment. But now we are just uh, making using our imagination uh, for an imaginary case. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think uh, we had nearly the, all the questions and uh, everybody uh, thanks to you uh, for this uh, presentation and uh, contribution uh, from every part. Everybody says uh, thank you. Uh, so I think we are okay with the questions. Uh, if, uh, if you don't have any questions, uh, more. Thank you. Thank you so much. Stay in touch. And uh, okay. I would like to Prof thank uh, as well, first to Edat, then to uh, Marco and Onur. Marco, that was a wonderful case to discuss on. And thank you so much. It was being presented so elegantly that we, we had the freedom to really be in front of the patient and discuss it. Thanks so much. And thank thanks you. for inviting me. And thank you also to GC that supports the, this activity. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone, uh, for your contribution. It was a, a mind shift, I think, for everyone from different perspectives. Uh, and I would like to thank you, uh, thank to uh, Edat and GC also for making this uh, happen. Uh, Professor Korkut Demiral, thank you very much. Professor Selim Pamuk, thank you very much. Professor Marka Ferrar, thank you very much. You remember my background? Yeah, sure. Beautiful. <laughs> I love it. I really, really love it. Thank you so much. <laughs>
And uh, with Sienna, uh, there is a fantastic. Work You'll be back soon. Like You'll be back you. soon for sure. Yes, we are. We are waiting to uh, come back and, we stay and in touch. Uh, have this information a lot. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you, everyone. To all for of you. Us. Uh, have a good day. You. Have a good fir- May first. Let's repeat it. Bye. Bye.